apostolic believer. And the way he does that is that he, uh, in many cases, he tries to get the, the apostolic Christian, the child of God, to um, become introspective. What that means is that they look at themselves other than looking at God. Now, of course, we do have to, uh, the Bible said, walk circumspectly before the Lord. That has to do with being careful, uh, walk in examination. But we should always be looking unto him and not just looking at our own abilities. Can the church say amen? Because we're not saved by our abilities. We're saved by grace. Can the church say amen? Or we're saved by the power of God, the grace of God that brings salvation and appearing unto all men. And that grace with our Lord and Savior who? Jesus Christ. And when he came, he brought power. He brought the ability to be successful in every walk of life, every facet of the uh, child of God's life. And that is a wonderful thing to think about, that we can be victorious. Amen. When I was a loser, I switched teams, amen. praise the Lord, and now I'm, now I'm a winner. Can the church say amen? Paul said in one place that I may win Christ. I think that's in the book of uh, Philippians. He speaks about uh, him winning Christ after he lost um, the world. Can the church say amen? amen. With that said, I guess, I guess I'll just deal with that in a preliminary thought. Let's go to the book of Philippians. I believe it is chapter 3. Praise the Lord, because this somewhat fits with our subject, which we've been teaching on propitiation, sanctification, and justification. Tonight, we're going to deal with a second part of this lesson, which is sanctification, which has to do with us being set apart, made holy, the attribute of holiness, which is, if anybody's making notes, holiness is all that God is. The scripture said God and God alone is holy. It is his character in his totality. He is pure. He is righteous. He is every attribute of right. He is every attribute of clean. Can the church say amen? There is no defilement. There is no unjustness in him. There is no wrong. There is no evil. He is light. Amen. Can the church say amen? amen. Uh, the Bible said, at the entrance of thy word giveth light, I think the scripture said. So light is synonymous with life. Can the church say amen? So God in every facet of the word is good. Can the church say amen? And any other um, words that we can, in the human vernacular, that we can put upon him that shows how pure he is, that is what he is. Can the church say amen? He's the purest of all. You follow me? Yes. But let's look at this because Paul gives the church at Philippi some, saying something that is, I think, very profound um, in his declaration of how he came to Christ. And there are two things that we can gain out of reading this. Number one, in order to gain Christ... There are certain things that everybody must lose. Amen. The number one thing that we lose is our autonomy. We lose our individuality and we become identified with him. Can the church say amen? Um, I believe Jesus spoke to the apostles when he called them, uh, Sister Richardson, uh, from their vocation. Some of them were fishermen. Uh, I think Matthew was a tax collector, a publican. Um, and one of them was actually a zealot or freedom fighter, religious freedom fighter in that day. And when they came to know Christ, they came out of all of those walks of life and they identified with who? Jesus. That's the same thing that happens with the Lord. Can the church say amen? This is exactly what we do. And this is, I don't know why I'm saying this tonight, but this, I guess it is a part of our lesson to a certain degree. Because sanctification means to, and or uh, sanctification means to be consecrated for a purpose. It means to be set aside for a specific purpose and a reason. And within that purpose or reason, that's the only thing that that um, uh, thing is supposed to be used for. I am a part of God's church, and I'm set up, set apart for His purpose. Whatever that purpose may be within His church. That is the only thing that I'm supposed to be used for. You see, as I said before and I'll say again, 
God wants something that is his and his alone. No, no different than in our lives, there are certain things in all of our houses that are ours, that you don't share with everybody. Can the church say amen? Anybody likes chocolate cake? Praise the Lord. Now, you may have a, a cake that you, that you cut up in 12 pieces, and you may give everybody a piece, but the last piece you say is mine. And if you, and you don't care how long it sits up there uh, on the refrigerator, you don't, know, you don't want anybody to touch it. Our mother used to say that. She would, you know, well, actually, she didn't say it, but uh, she had certain things, and I gave you this analogy before. She used to like Pepsi. And she would send me to the store. This was back in the days when the Pepsis were in, when, when, when Pop came in bottles. You remember that? Now they got, now that's uh, dangerous. Now they don't make bottles anymore. I mean, glass bottles. Now they come in plastic containers, right? Yes. So she would tell me to go to the store and get her what she wanted. I could be outside playing, running around, having a good time, and she would holler out of the house and give me a dollar or whatever they cost back then. I don't know how much they cost. They probably give. Yeah, I'm not that old. I don't think, I'm, I'm just kidding, Brother Bobby. I don't think they're quite, they're quite, uh, they're quite, they uh, quite were, uh, were a dime, but they were not a dollar because you can get them for a dollar now. Probably about 50 cents or a quarter. Let's say a quarter. Okay, we'll go that low. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Whatever it was. But in any case, she would send me and I would have to run to the store to go get her Pepsi. And she would take that Pepsi, she would put it in the back of the refrigerator. Sometimes she would open it. She would take a few drinks of it, put it back in there. But I knew that that was hers. But I wasn't, of course, sanctified then. So I would rather, I, wouldn't, I don't want to say politely, I would go into the refrigerator and I would drink a little bit, hoping that she would not notice. But every now and then I went a little bit too far. And she recognized that somebody was in her things. The point I'm trying to get to by giving you that analogy, if there are things, saints, that are, our, that are ours in this world that God gives us the right to have, praise the Lord, there are certain things that are his in as much as everything belongs to him. And when it comes to the church and when it comes to what God wants to do for us, um, he wants to give us, in order for me to receive it, I have to be willing to give myself to him. You follow me? So Paul is going to give us a powerful example as to where he came from and what he lost to get what he has. So he valued one thing greater than the other. And so when it comes to sanctification and us allowing God to set us apart for his purpose, we have to value what he wants to give us more than what we want ourselves. Because every man has a, we every, every man has a will. We have children right now and we control their will. Because they're not able to uh, do what they want to do because they're not come of age. But there, there's going to come a time when those children will grow up and no matter what we say to them, they'll do whatever they choose to do. But the one thing about God is that God has made every man a free will agent. And at some point in his life, he does what he wants to do. But at the end of the day... God still is in control of the consequences and of the rewards that one receives based upon their will. You follow what I'm saying? So let's look at what Paul, Paul is saying something profound because Paul came out of one thing and went to another. This fits in with our lesson today because we're going to talk about the, the next part of this lesson which is sanctification. Which has to do with being set apart, being made holy, being made moral, consecrated. It is the character of God that shines in a person's life, a lifestyle acceptable to God, an active dedication to the service of God, Amen. and or uh, the, the act of regarding and honoring his holiness. That's what sanctification is. And sanctification is a process. Amen. It is a process that we go through. Bishop Herman said it like this. When it comes to the progress of, uh, progression of the child of God, some are on a steeper climb and some are on a gradual climb. What that means is this, everybody matures and grows at different levels Amen. in their walk with God. 
depending on how they submit themselves to the will of God. You follow what I'm saying? Some people don't grow because they don't submit. Some people submit slower than others and yet are growing. Some people submit faster and grow faster. That all depends on the will of the individual, what they're willing to do to allow God to do what he wants to do. And like I said before, and we're going to deal with in this Bible class, we're going to deal with the word of sanctification, the sanctifier, and the place where sanctification takes place. All these things are essential. If any one of these things are out of place, then there's no way for the one that God is trying to sanctify or trying to set apart or use for his purpose can be used. Now, I'm, I'm kind of double talking here, but I want you to understand. When Paul gives us this ex explanation, he was in a place where he had a knowledge of God, a zeal for God, but he did not have truth. And in order for him, Sister Martin, to be totally used for the purpose and the glory of God, he had to move from one place to another. And the church say amen. So let's read here. Let me see here. Um, we want to start with verses 5. Paul is giving us his, somebody say his credentials. Paul was the most qualified, qualified individual of all the apostles to deal with the scriptures as he did. So let's read here. He says, circumcised the eighth day. Are we there? Chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, verse 5. Cir circumcised the eighth day of the stock of, uh, of Benjamin, I mean, excuse, excuse me, the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the, uh, the law, Pharisee, read, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, as touching the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. So which, what Paul is saying was that he's giving us his lineage, where he, come, where he came from. And he makes the point, Bishop, in these scriptures that when it, as it pertains to the law of God, he was blameless. Praise the Lord. He was blame there was nothing in the law that they can find on him, yet he still needed to be saved. You follow what I'm saying? He had a seat, uh, he had a seat in the synagogue persecuting the church. Now, he was blamable in, from that regard, but when we deal with the Old Testament law, in its purest sense, he was, he was blameless. There was not a spot on him from that regard, even though he was a sinner when it, come, when it came to the truth that God was trying to give him. You follow me? All right? Read. But what things were gained to me? Now, what did he gain? He gained the adoration. He gained the jubilation. He gained the honor of men. Because remember, it was Paul that consented to the death of Stephen. Stephen, the first martyr in the church. They laid, they, uh, as it were, they laid their coats at his feet. He was the one that had papers from the high priest to go and persecute the church. He gained all of that respect of men. Can the church say amen? And this is, to a certain degree, um, an example to us in our day of what we gain in the world. There are many people who gain honor, they gain prestige, they gain fame, they gain glory in the world. But once they come into the church, those things have to be lost. Amen. Praise the Lord. Because there are certain things when it comes to sanctification and holiness that I cannot carry into my new life. Matter of fact, everything that is contrary to God. You follow what I'm saying? So let me give an example so you can understand why I say, why I say that. When it comes to individuals that go out into the world and get involved with, secular, uh, with, with the secular progressive movement and uh, they take their gifts, they have talents in the church, they're good singers, they're musicians, praise the Lord. They take those gifts, they gain uh, uh, the prestige of man, they come, become famous and rich singing um, the, the, the music of the world. When they come into the church, if they come into the church, they cannot take that same spirit and bring it into the church. They can't take the secular music and bring it into the house of God. They have to leave that stuff where they, where they found it. You follow what I'm saying? That's this one example. You, you understand? So this is what 
we can equate it to our day, that there are things that every child of God loses to gain. Did not Jesus say it like this? Let me give you the scripture so you can understand. This fits in with our lesson. Let's go to Matthew chapter number 16. Now, I'm going off of memory here now. I just want to give you this scripture. We're going to come back to what Paul was dealing with here. But this is fitting for what we're trying to get across here when it comes to sanctification. These three key essential words that deal with um, the church. Chapter number 16. And let me see here what verse do I want. Twenty-four. Praise the Lord. Loss is a part of gaining when it comes to God. There are things that everybody loses. I lost some good friends when I got saved. In the world, I lost some, some people, my running buddies. I lost those guys. They didn't want to have anything to do with this Jesus stuff. They thought, I, what you talking about Jesus? We trying to get high. What you talking about? Y'all looking at me funny, but I'm telling you, we trying to, we, don't be ruining our, ruining our party. You had to lose it. I'm just giving you an example. Can I, be, can I be frank tonight? Holiness separates. Jesus said it like this. I came to separate father from mother, sister from brother, daughter-in-law from mother-in-law. He said, I came with a sword. You know what that sword was? The word. The word of God is like Sister Richardson, a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. And in that day, a two-edged sword was the sharpest instrument known to man. In our day, it's a laser. You guys know that? They have lasers, Deacon, that can cut a cataract off a person's eye without damaging the surface of their eye and blemishing their eyesight. The sharpest thing in that day was the word of God was a two, excuse me, a two-edged sword. So he's likened the word of God as a two-edged sword. And it cuts everything off that is superfluous. Can the church say amen? If it's useless, I don't need it. So when it came to me being saved, I didn't need certain things. Can the church say amen? Matter of fact, the, uh, when, I, when I came to the church in Jackson where I got saved, one of my running buddies was with me. We was in the back of the church like, yeah, you know, we thought we was cool. Look, look at these folk up in here. What's wrong with these people? I'm trying to see, I'm trying to make a score. Praise the Lord. I'm, but, but, God, but God was trying to make a score too. <laughs> you see, we might as well be honest with ourselves. Some of us got, came to church because somebody told us to come. But God was getting the hook in our jaw. He was fishing. See, see he's a fisherman. Praise the Lord. That's what he told the apostles. I'll make you what? Fish is a man. Praise the Lord. When I came into Jackson, I didn't know what was going on up in that church. These people screaming and hollering and saying hallelujah. What is going on up in here? This man is up in the pulpit preaching. I'm trying to figure out what is, this is foreign to me. But, the, but God was dealing with me. Can the church say amen? And that was this one way of drawing you in. See, that's the way God does. He'll hook you and he'll let you run. And then, when you get so far, Sandy, he starts to drag on me. And he starts reeling me in. <laughs> That's, isn't that what we do, Bishop? See, you know, see, when I, I've been fishing for a while, I know when I got a fish that I got to play a little bit. I can't, I can't just reel them in. You know, my equipment is not quite set up for the size of fish I got. You know, if I'm, if I'm finesse fishing, I may have eight-pound line on, you know, and I got a fish that I caught deep. He's, you know, 30, 40 yards away from the boat. So I just can't hold it. I can't tighten the drag down. I got to let him run for a minute. Sometimes you got to go to him. I remember, sometimes you got to pull the anchor up, Bishop. Isn't that right? And you got you to gotta go to the fish. Sometimes I catch him in the lily pads. And I don't want to rip the hook out their mouth. And I'm trying to get him up. And I see he's on. So I just say, okay, look, I just got to go to him. He don't want to come to me. I'm going to have to go to him. That's what God does. He sets the drag on us. Sometimes he, he, he goes right where we're at and then pulls us out. And the church say amen. 
So let's read this verse here so we can get the point of what we're trying to make here. Because God was setting the drag on, on Paul, wasn't he? Because we're going to get back to that scripture. God was trying to reel Paul in. He told Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. So it's obvious that God was dealing with Paul prior to his conversion. Prior to the road to Damascus, God was dealing with us about sanctification and holiness prior to us coming in. We never would have came in if it wasn't for that. Amen. Let's read this scripture here. Verse number 24. Amen. Then said Jesus, excuse me, to his disciples, if any man will come after me. Now this is the point he's trying to make. If any man, any man, any man that is that has a desire to come after him. That's any white man, black man, red man, yellow man. What's the other uh, color human family? Brown. The five colors of the human family, no matter what color, what that nationality, no matter where they come from, every man has to come to him this way. This is the hard part about sanctification, that people have to come from one place of familiarity and go to a place that they have no clue about. When I came into the church, I didn't know nothing about no holiness. But my desire and God dealing with my heart, Sister Johnson, drew me. And I learned a whole new way of living. Praise the Lord. That was totally foreign. But God blessed our lives when we were, when we were able to follow him. So let's keep reading this verse here. Let him deny himself. Take up his cross. Now, now you notice with, with all of these verses, with this verse, excuse me, everything is dealing with the individual. Amen. Can the church say amen? Because God saves us as individuals. The Bible said, save yourself from this untoward generation. Nobody gets saved collectively. We get saved individually. Going back to my original analogy, when I had my partner with me, God was drawing me. I don't know what the Lord was, de was dealing with him about, but it's obvious that he drew me in, but he didn't come. You follow me? But yet God gave us both equal opportunity. You follow me? So here's another point. When, when, when we come to God, we can't try to pull somebody else with us. Praise the Lord. I come by myself. My wife is saved. I'm saved. I know she wants to be saved. She knows I wants to be, want to be saved. And I can use that as an example because she won't get upset with me. Praise the Lord. So I can't try to be saved for her. She can't try to be saved for me. We have to be saved for ourselves. Amen. Can the church say amen? We have to pick up our cross. Our cross represents whatever we have to bear. Can the church say amen? Read. And what? And follow me. Who we're following? Jesus, I got another scripture for you. Jesus was speaking to the disciples and the, some of the things, because there were more than just the 12 that followed him, some of the things that he said were hard to be understood. And he told, and, and then they left. And then the scripture said, he turned to the 12. And he says, will ye also go back? And Peter, as a spokesman, stood up and said, to whom shall we go for thou has the words of eternal life. See, they were supposed to be following Jesus. You follow me? So he made the point, Sister, jo Sister Johnson, we have nobody else to follow. So who are we supposed to be following? Jesus. Can the church say amen? Another scripture, and I, I don't know why these scriptures come into my mind, but I want us to catch this. Jesus was dealing with an individual. There was one mother who came and said, well, Lord, grant my sons to sit one on your right hand and one on your left hand in, in glory. And he looked at her and said, the only way that that would take place, and I'm paraphrasing, is that they would have to be willing to drink the cup that I drink from. Praise the Lord. Then he goes on and tells them, the foxes have holes, the birds of the field have nests, but the son of man have no place to lay their head. What he was saying, are they willing to follow me and deal with what I deal with or go through what, what I go through? Go with, or go through with me. That's the only way they'll get it. Can the church say amen? And this scripture is true because I've suffered some things in walking with God, but I've been blessed so much greater. Because the Bible said it like this, that the present sufferings is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be filled. And anything we go through anyway, it's not even comparable to what he went through. 
Can the church say amen? Walking with God is a wonderful thing. Can't you tell? I eat good. I'm looking fairly good. I hope so. God is good. Praise the Lord all the time. I am blessed. I don't see anybody out here looking like they ain't ate in a while. Praise the Lord. We all doing all right around here. <laughs> can the church say amen? You can laugh. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Let's read here. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. What he's saying, whosoever shall save his life or preserve his life in this life shall lose his, uh, yes, his, his, op his opportunity of eternal life. Read. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake. Whosoever shall lose his life in this world or forsake the, the, the life in the world for Jesus' sake shall find eternal life. There's a trade-off. But the trade-off is greater than anything that we gain. Than we, me, anything that we lose, excuse me. I traded garbage for, for treasure. I traded trash for the greatest thing that I ever could imagine. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right. Read here. For what is a... What, now, this is powerful here. Read. What is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? What he's saying, what is the value of gaining this world and losing your soul? Now, why does Jesus make that statement? I'm going to tell you why. Because everything in this world or the profit that we gain in this kingdom, I'm talking about in the natural kingdom of this world, is only for a space of time. Everything in this world is temporal, is transitory, is effervescent. It doesn't last. Nothing in the world lasts. Look at yourself in the mirror. Praise the Lord. I look in the mirror, say, I figured, I figured I ain't lasting. See, sometimes people don't want to deal with reality. We need to wake up. People need to wake up and smell the coffee. Praise the Lord. Paul, not, no, not Paul, but I think James spoke of life as a vapor of smoke. It's here one day, it's gone tomorrow. Another writer spoke of, spoke of life as the flower of the grass. That is here one moment and gone the next. I can remember Sister Richardson when I looked a whole lot better. You can too, praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. But guess what happened? Brother Casey, the wind blew on me. It blows on us. And then we change form. But that's all right. Because what's in these bodies is eternal life. Amen. He that have the son, talking about once you get saved, he that have the son has eternal life. Now that I'm saved, this life doesn't, val it doesn't have much value. So what Jesus was saying, what, does it get, what, what gain is it to profit in this world? It lose your soul because your soul is the only thing that lives forever. See, the body knows that it ain't going to heaven. That's the reason why it gives you the fits. The body don't care about sanctification, about holiness, living right. The body wants what it wants. The body, the Bible said it like this concerning our flesh. The eye is never full of sin. The flesh is never full of warning. That's the reason why when, when individuals in the world get involved with addictive behaviors, it consumes them. Because this body craves more and more of what it can't have. Wow. Praise the Lord. Anything in excess will kill you. Drink too much water and watch what happens. Water is good for you. But drink too much of it, it can be harmful. Praise the Lord. You follow me? So the, the point I'm trying to get at is in reading this is that we lose and we gain. When it comes to sanctification, we let one thing go. To gain something else. Can the church say amen? And what I gain in Christ, Brother Phil says Johnson, is greater than anything I've lost. Can the church say amen? All right, let's finish reading. Gain the whole world, lose his soul. Or what can a man give in exchange for a soul? Now, if you, in your spare time, go and read um, Psalms 49, verses 6 to 8. The Bible makes the point in that verse, and I'm going off memory, of course, is that there is nothing 
that a man can trade for his redemption. You follow me? There's nothing that you have in this world that you can trade to gain, your, to, to gain salvation. Your salvation is precious. The redemption of your soul is precious. That goes back to the propitiation or the expiator, which is Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ was the only thing of value that God would accept us to as a trade-off for me to be saved. His blood. Can the church say amen? amen. So the redemptive process of God through the, him, uh, ex, through the expiator and Jesus Christ coming and dying for our sins, us accepting the same gave us a trade-off that we couldn't give ourselves. Amen. So Jesus is saying, it's nothing in this world that you can gain that is have more value than your soul. And it's nothing that a man can give in exchange for his soul. Praise the Lord. When, when people, I'll give you an example, and, and this is not going to happen. I'm just going to build a picture in your mind. I can't get to heaven and say, well, Lord, you know, because this is what people, you know, people have these, these thoughts of the, these pearly gates in heaven, and, and Peter's standing at the, at, the side, at the side saying, okay, you can come in, you can't. That's a bunch of nonsense. I'm just telling you, trying to make a point that I have nothing that I can offer to God at the great white throne of judgment, and he said, well, okay, okay, that's good enough. No, if I don't have him, I won't even make it there. I'll make it there, but I won't, I'll make it there in the end, but I will not receive salvation. I'll be lost. You follow what I'm saying? So the point is simply this. We, get, we, we lose to gain. Can the church say amen? So let's go back now, now to Paul. Let's see what Paul lost. Can the church say amen? Let's go now back to, uh, let's deal with Paul, I should say. Let's go now back to Philippians chapter number 3. I guess the Bible class is almost consumed with this, but, it all, but this is a part of what we're teaching, so I guess it is a part of sanctification. Can the church say amen? amen. Let's start with verses numbers 7. But what things were gained to me, those things I count lost for who? Christ. He, he is fulfilling what Christ said in the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew. Praise the Lord. He lost his identity with the religion of his, of his um, how can I say, of his youth. He lost his identity with the Pharisees. He lost his, his identity in sitting in the synagogues and having the prestige of men. One of the elders. He lost all of that. Read. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of God, for the knowledge in the relationship with Christ, he counted everything in his past life lost. Can the church say amen? There's no wagon, there is no, uh, there, there, there's no baggage that I can drag over into the church once I come into the knowledge of God. I leave all those things alone. Can the church say amen? Read. Uh, of Jesus, of Jesus my Lord. Read. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. You know what dung is? Any, country, any people that, that lived out in the country know what dung is? It, exactly. That's another word for it. It is waste byproduct from the bowel. That's what he's saying. He, what he, this is powerful because he's saying everything that I gained in the world has no value. Because, I don't mean to be morbid here, but I want to make a point so you can understand, because Paul said this. Can someone say, Paul said this? Paul makes the point that everything that he had in the world, he counted it as nothing. Because what do you do with that? You flush it down the toilet. Praise the Lord! You get rid of it. Isn't that right? That's what, that, that's what he's, he's saying, that is the value of the world. <laughs> in the church say amen it's praise the Lord you follow what I'm trying to say I, I say this all the time I'm not studying what them folk out there doing the saints meeting in, in this saints meeting I'm not concerned about what the world is doing because the world is not going to heaven I'm going to heaven I had to come out of that in order to gain Christ can the church say amen but the problem we face today is the carnality of the flesh when people want to hold on to 
the old life and drag that with them to heaven. The Bible said laying aside every weight, something, here's the point, some things are weights that drag one down that turns into sin. Some people are weights. Some activities are weights. Can the church say amen? Some TV shows are weights. Praise the Lord. It's just a bunch of foolishness. It, it doesn't add. See, here's, here's, here's the way we need to look at it, saints. If it adds no value to my walk with God, what is the purpose of it? We have, a, we have enough things to do in this world that deals with the carnality of the flesh. I have to feed my flesh. I have to go to work. None of us are in the spirit all day. Follow me? The problem is that some people spend too much time outside of the spirit. Some things that we do are just natural things. They have no spiritual value. That are not necessarily wrong, but it's just a part of human life. But when people spend, Deacon, too much time on evaluating that, and they don't count the loss of the world as dung or, 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 or having no value, they lose perspective on what matters. Praise the Lord. So the scriptures, as we come into the house of God, there's a washing of the water by the word. Praise the Lord. That is the word of sanctification that cleanses us. It, get, it puts us back into perspective. It gives us an understanding of what, that, what, we, what we should value. Praise the Lord. What matters? Can the church, some things can wait. Some things I don't have to do. Some things if I don't do, then it can get me in trouble. Some things, if I do, it won't matter. So we have to put all of those things in perspective so that we can value what is right. So Paul learned the value of Christ when he allowed God to deal with him and then change his course. You follow what I'm saying? But Sister Deanna, we're living in a day right now where people don't want anybody to tell them what to do. You, it's, it's, the age of social media is so high that people are being taught by these demon-possessed people. And I'm telling I'm calling it like it is. These people have demons. Amen. And they tell you that it's your thing. Do whatever you want to do. You don't have to listen to nobody. Don't listen to the police. Don't listen to your mother. Don't listen to your father. You are an authoritarian of and of, of, and of yourself. And whatever your mind thinks is right. You know, some people think whatever comes to their mind is right. Praise the Lord. Now, that's the reason why this man was, what did, what did he do? He was, this man was over here. They had to lock the, uh, what did they do? They locked up the, the kids in the daycare over here because this man was stealing things and running down the street shooting. Wow. You guys didn't know anything about that? Yeah. He, was, he was shooting. That's what Brother Tinsdale was talking about. And then we got a call from Sister, Sister Martin, and she told us that, because she was over here at the daycare, and she told me and Amy uh, that they got the street on lockdown, and we had to call the police and find out uh, if we can leave the church. I had to go pick my kids up. We called the church. We called a, the, uh, I call, Amy called the school. And I said, you got these kids on lockdown? Because I'm not finna, I don't want to go out here and have no crazy man running down the street. He thought, but see, here's the point. He thought what he was doing was okay. Praise the Lord. That's the reason why people do this crazy stuff. Because they have their own way of, of what they think is right. But uh, when it comes to God, he teaches us morality, he teaches us decency, he teaches us honesty, he teaches us how to love one another. Can the church say amen? So come to find out, the police said, if you do leave, don't go east on 44th Street, go west. So what did I do? I went west, praise the Lord. I went the direction they told me to go because I was not trying to deal with this crazy gunman. You follow me? All right, let's, let's continue reading here so we, can get, so we can finish this. That we may what? He says that I may what? Win Christ. Now, what is he trying to win? He's trying to win the election. He's trying to be in the election. He's trying to win the prize. He's not running as one that is unconcernedly that beateth the air. He's running with a purpose. We are in the church for a purpose. The purpose is to run to the extent that we will make the rapture Amen. and see Jesus. When? 
See, the church, God's church, will be a winner. Amen. Brother Bobby, God doesn't lose. Amen. He doesn't know how to lose. Hallelujah. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. He's never lost. Never. So when it comes to our walk with God, he wants us to somebody say win. And walking in sanctification sets you up Glory. to win Christ. Glory. Can the church say amen? And what did he say? And being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is by faith. So under the law, one can be righteous without committing the act. If they didn't commit the act, they were righteous. But their heart could have had every desire to do, do wrong. But if they didn't do the act, they wasn't, they wasn't wrong. In the church, we walk with God by faith through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we have, he, God has now changed our desire not to even want to commit the act. Can the church say amen? amen. I guess that's good enough there. Let's now, let's go here. I want to deal with um, the word of sanctification. I'm going to deal with these three points. I got about 15 minutes to try to wrap this up. Let's go to St. John chapter number 17. The word of sanctification. Can the church say amen? Then we'll deal with the sanctifier or the person of sanctification and then the place where we are sanctified. Can the church say amen? Or where we are set apart for his glory. Let's go to St. John chapter number 17, verse 17. We can almost quote this verse. Those of you who have been in the church for years, you can probably, you probably know where I'm going. Can the church say amen? amen. Praise the Lord. This is what Jesus was doing as the person of sanctification and or the sanctifier. He was depositing his word in their life that was likened unto a seed that would grow, praise the Lord, and would produce fruit in his proper time. Now, as he's speaking to his disciples, he's not so much looking for them to produce fruit at that point in time. But once the word that they were hearing would come into a place that it was ready to blossom and they were uh, at the point where the word of God that he gave them um, uh, in his teaching uh, was ready to break forth in their lives, they could produce what he wanted. You follow what I'm saying? So this is the reason why the apostles, uh, let's say namely Peter, Peter made some mistakes because Peter was not yet converted. You follow me? But the word of God was still in his consciousness because he was taught by the Lord. So God expected when it was time for him to receive what the word of God wanted to give him, it was able to grow and then he could produce. And that's exactly what he did on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Ghost fell on the 120, the word that was in Peter came up out of him and he spoke the word that God gave him once God sanctified him. Follow what I'm saying? But let's read this verse here because this is a wonderful verse. So he's speaking. I'm in the wrong verse, am I? No, I'm in the right place. Thank you, Holy Ghost. He's speaking to his disciples. And he's saying how they'll be sanctified. Let's read here. Sanctify them. He says, sanctify them through what? Thy truth. How are we sanctified? Through the word of sanctification or the truth of God. The right division of the word, we taught a subject on that. The right division of the word will give us an opportunity to be set apart. To be made like him. Because all God is trying to do in the church is to make me like him. That's all he wants. Amen. In this saints meeting, because this is, uh, this is what we have... Uh, entitled this, these particular Bible classes is that God is trying to deal with the nuts and bolts of the apostolic child of God. You understand what I'm saying? As a, as a master mechanic, and that's just an example I'm using, he goes in, he tunes us up, he makes sure our timing is on. Praise the Lord. He changes the belts. He changes the oil. He lubes us. Why? Because the only purpose that he has for us is that we would run as a well-oiled machine according to his glory. Now, I'm using that as an example so we can understand. Every now and then, what you do with your car is that you take it to a mechanic. Isn't that right? 
is sometimes we know we need to take it to the mechanic because we have those little indicator lights on the dashboard. We, don't, we just don't take tape and put tape over once they're flashing, do we? It's a check engine soon. Little oil, you get a little oil dispenser. I remember, <laughs> I don't know why I'm giving this example. Uh, I came home um, one, one time with, uh, and I was, um, went to go visit my mom. And she said, Dorian, I need you to go check my car. It's making noises. So I turned the car on. I'm, it's knocking. I said, what is going on here? It's just making a horrible noise. It's knocking, knocking, click, 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 click. So I said, shut the car off, man. Shut it off right now. Pop the hood. Check the oil. It has no oil in it at all. I said, mother, you cannot drive a car without any oil. He said, oh, I don't. I said, mother, I wouldn't be saying this if she was here. But the point, the point, the point being is that it wasn't maintained. I mean, I, I'm being honest with you. There was, there was nothing, Brother Casey, on the dipstick. Zero. I said, Mom, you ought to be thankful that this motor did not seize up on you. This is a testament that the make and model of car that you have is a good one. Because by all accounts, it should have blew up. Oh, yes, it, wanted, yes, it will. They, have you ever noticed? You ever seen that? The engines have so much. Some engines have so much power that it can shoot metal out of the top of the engine. You follow what I'm saying? So I said, "Mom, we need to put some oil in this car." <laughs> Praise the Lord. So leave it right here. Do not drive it. The point I'm trying to make is that every now and then God has to perform maintenance upon His people and and inspire us to continue to allow the word of sanctification, the word of truth, the Bible said, the doctrine of Christ to be effectual in our life. And as we yield to the seed of the word, praise the Lord, we'll be made more like him. So he says here, sanctify them through thy truth. What is truth? Thy word is truth. No, no, they say what is truth. Thy word is truth. What, the word of God is truth. And Jesus said it like this in the 14th chapter of the book of St. John. He says, I am the way, the truth, and life. I'm the person of truth. I'm the way of truth. I'm the life that is produced by truth. There is no life outside of God's word. Can the church say amen? Now let's go to Ephesians chapter number 5. We're going to get ready to wrap this up. Any good today? It's a wonderful thing when God engages with his people through his truth. Praise the Lord. See, we have to allow God to give us an ear to hear. See, some, there are two types of hearing. There is natural hearing and then there's spiritual hearing. Some people hear with their natural ear, but everybody doesn't hear with their spiritual ear. When we hear with our spiritual ear, we allow the word of God to accomplish what it wants to accomplish. We are sensitive to what he says. And we allow that word to penetrate into our spiritual consciousness where the ch we allow the changes to take place. Can the church say amen? See, what Paul was doing prior to his conversion, he was resisting the hand of God. That's why he told him, it's hard for you to kick against the prick. He was resisting God's pricking at his heart. Nobody in the church today came in the church because they wanted, just wanted to get here. It was because God was drawing you and you yielded to the urge and the call of God. You follow what I'm saying? To the admonishment, the encouragement, the urge of him pulling. How does he pull? He pulls at our mind. We can't get the words that he's speaking out of our mind. He brings about situations that bring back to our mind what we need to do. That's how he pulls. That's how he tugs. Praise the Lord. Bishop Pat, I gave an example years ago, uh, many, many years ago, before he was saved, he came to a, to a church, to a meeting, and um, I, forget, I think it was Bishop Lewis, I think he said, was preaching. And he was preaching about the table of the Lord and the table of the devil. And he said, that preacher had my feet under the wrong table the whole night. 
And this was his testimony. He said that if he would have came outside, I would have choked him. <laughs> but here's the point. That word that Bishop Lewis preached never left his consciousness. And it was that word that drew him. You, you understand what I'm saying? We've seen the song, Who Is That Knocking? Calling. That's a song that deals with how God pulls us. Praise the Lord. I can remember sitting in Bible classes and I could not get the word that Bishop Julian was teaching out of my mind. So this, we do this. Y'all, praise the Lord. I know what I'm talking about. This is what people do. Well, I'm, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to go wash some clothes. I'm going to go take a run. I'm going to go try, try to fall asleep and you get a dream. You follow what I'm saying? I'm going to try to do something totally different. But, it, but the word of God doesn't leave. That's the call of God. That's the pricking of the heart. Wow. You follow what I'm saying? That's how God works. Amen. When he brings back to your remembrance what he's trying to deal with you about and you can't get it out of your mind, you need to go, and, you need to go get some answers. Wow. You follow what I'm saying? Amen. This is how God saves us. This is how he sanctifies us. He calls us through his word, the truth, and begins to work upon us. Why? Because it's not his will that any should perish. It's not, he does not want any little one to be lost. Let me show you an example. Now, where did I tell you to go? Ephesians. We're going to come back to Ephesians next week, but this is this verse we need to get. Let's go now to the 18th chapter of St. John. St. Matthew, I'm sorry. I want to show you the extent that God goes to save one soul. There's a parable in your Bible that deals with this. God exhausts all resources and measures that he has within his, within, within his arsenal to save one individual. 18th chapter, Matthew. Praise the Lord. It is the parable of the lost sheep. Let me see here. Let's start with verses numbers... Um, We'll start with verse numbers 11, and we'll read verses 11 through 13. This is our last verse here tonight. Read. Verse 18. Matthew chapter uh, 18, verse 11. All right, let's read here. For the Son of Man is, uh, is come to save that which was lost. See, the, the Republicans and the... Let me see. That's a joke. <laughs> That's a joke. The, the publicans and the sinners were the ones that he came to save. Yes, he came to save. The publicans and the sinners he came to save. He came to save all, but he was not so much concerned about the self-righteous. He wanted them to be saved. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees were self-righteous. He came to call sinners to repentance. The lost. Those that are whole, he said, have no need of a, of a physician. Now, this fits everybody. Prior to being saved, all of us had sin and come short of the glory of God. Praise the Lord. So, but there were some in that day that were self-righteous. And when they came to him, he said, I came to save the lost. So y'all think y'all okay. I'm not even going to deal with you. I'm going to those who need it or who know what they need and want it. You follow me? All right, verses numbers um, 12. He says, How think ye if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine and go into the mountains and seek that which is gone astray? Now this is an example that deals with every individual man that God seeks out to be saved. We were sheep going astray. We were outside of the commonwealth of God. We were, not, we were not where we needed to be. And he went to the furthest extent to get one of us. When I came into Jackson, my, my, my homeboy was sitting next to me. We was in the back of the... Well, I don't know where we was at in the church. We thought we was cool. But God was fishing and getting one sheep. Glory. And I was that sheep. Glory. 
This is what Jesus is trying to say. God will go to the, every extent that he has and every resource that he has to make sure he saves one. Thank you, Lord. you follow me? All right, leave the 99 and, go, and go, right, go into the mountains and seek that which is gone astray. Read. And if so be that he findeth it, verily I say unto you, he rejoice over that what sheep. When he finds that soul that he's been seeking, he rejoices. The Bible said the heavens rejoice when one sinner repents. When a person gets saved, the angels in heaven is rejoicing. The glories of God are rejoicing. Why? Because somebody came to Christ. And this is exactly how we feel. When people come and get, they get saved, the church, you can see how the church is affected by it. Because that's all the church is about. I say this all the time. God's church is not a social club. It, this, this ain't the country club. <laughs> this is not a, a place, a, a party or a gathering. It is, the, it is a place for salvation. It is a place where God saves, he sanctifies, he makes us what he wants us to be. Can the church say hallelujah? All right. Then, let me see, then, uh, then of the 90 and 9 which are not astray. He rejoices more over one being saved than th those that he already has. Can the church say amen. So God wants all of us, somebody say, to make it. Can the church say amen? Verse 14, read. Even, even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven. See, it is not the will. This is the reason why I say people are going to be lost going contrary to God's will. If anybody don't make it, they're, they're going to make it going contrary to what God wants. Because he says, even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. This parable deals with the extent that God goes to save one. God doesn't want anybody to be lost. So he will send the pastor to, to preach the word of God. He will send the pastor to counsel and as his representative, praise the Lord, to give the scriptures of reconciliation, to give the scriptures to show what the apostolic child of God ought to do. Why? Because he don't want one soul to be lost. Amen. Can the church say amen? Anybody have any questions tonight? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. 